friends and Cabby Yerksa families. Uh, today is not only April Fool's Day, April 1st, um, it is Census Day. So please, please make sure that you're going on to my2020census.gov to fill those out. It not only counts how many people live in your home, but also our cities, our states, uh, making sure that the proper funding can go towards education, healthcare, etc. cetera. Uh, because of Census today, I'm gonna be reading to you Tricking the Tally Man by Jacqueline Davies, illustrated by S.D. Schindler. How many people live in your house? How many people live on your street? Could you count them all? What if you had to count everyone in your whole city or town? Could you do that? How? There was a time when the United States was a brand new country with a brand new government. In order to make laws that were strong and fair, the government needed to know how many people were living in each part of the country. So in 1790, it sent out 650 marshals to tally, that means count, the people, all the people, without computers, cars, and calculators. These men sent out on horseback to count every single person living in the United States. How did they do it? Well, see that fellow over there, the one who's drooping in his saddle? Take a closer look, dear reader, because he is a tally man, brave and determined to get his count. A rather tricky task, as you're about to discover. When Phineas Bump rode into the town of Tunbridge, he was heartsick, saddle sore, and down on his luck. Heartsick because he hadn't seen his beloved wife Jenny in three months. Saddle sore because he'd been riding through the Rudy Vermont woods. Down on his luck because his saddlebag was completely empty. How can I count the people without paper, ink, and quills? He asked his horse Blue. Blue, being a horse, didn't answer. She just stopped at the first house on the edge of town. Phineas dismounted, mumbling, I know, I know, count them I must, and count them I will. He approached the door. Knock, knock. A woman opened the door, but just a crack. Madame, he proclaimed, I am Phineas Bump, Assistant Marshal of the United States of America. By order of our Congress and Constitution, I am here to tally the people of the District of Vermont. Be gone, tally man, said the woman, for we are a town that won't be counted. Bang, went the door in Phineas's face. Oh no, he said softly, tis another one looking for a fight. Phineas liked a challenge. He stiffened his spine and raised his hand to the door. Knock, knock, knock. The woman opened the door again, but only half a crack. Count you I must and count you I will, said Phineas. But for tonight, I seek only a roof over my head. Might there be an inn nearby? We have neither inn nor tavern, for we are a town that doesn't welcome strangers. Bang. Phineas's smile widened. Uh-oh. Hey, yeah, a challenge indeed. Perhaps I could sleep in the corner of your shed, he shouted. But this time, the door didn't open at all. Not one inch. Phineas just laughed as he grabbed Blue's brittle and walked to a nearby stand of white pines. Should we give up and go home, old Blue, he asked. As he unsaddled his horse, Blue tossed her head. That's what I think, too, said Phineas, and he unrolled his blanket and laid down to sleep on the cold, hard ground. Meanwhile, on the other side of the door, Mrs. Pepper called out, Children, come quick! The terrible tally man has come to Tunbridge. What's a tally man? asked Mercy. Oh, he's an awful scoundrel sent by the government, said Mrs. Pepper. He counts every person in a town, and the more people he counts, the more money our town will have to pay. That's called taxes, said Boston. Mrs. Pepper nodded. Aye, and if there is another war, the government will know how many men we have and will steal them away to be soldiers. That's called conscription, said Boston. Aye, it is, my boy. Devils and deuces, whatever shall we do? Patience burst into tears. Thomas hid in the wood box, but Boston said, Don't worry, Ma, I've got a plan. Uh-oh, hey ya, we will be the town that tricks the tally man. In the morning, Phineas rose and brushed the pine needles out of his hair. Count them I must, and, well, you know, he said to Blue before walking to the Pepper house. Knock, knock. Mrs. Pepper opened the door grandly and offered Phineas the best seat by the fire. He pulled out an empty ink pot, a broken quill, and a letter. Tis from my wife, he explained, but as I haven't any other paper, I will use this to make my record. 
Mrs. Pepper stared sharply at the date on the letter. Two months old? Has it been that long since you've seen her? That long and longer, sighed Phineas. Phineas scooped some ashes from the fire into the ink pot, mixed them with his spittle, and dipped the broken quill into the bottle. Then at in the margin of the letter, Phineas carefully wrote, Tunbridge, October 18th, 1790. He turned to Mrs. Pepper. Madame, your name? Sarah Pepper. Your husband is, alas, gone, she said, clasping her hands and looking heavenward. My condolences, Widow Pepper, and how many children have you? Not a one. Phineas looked up. I count three mattresses, a jack bed with a trundle, and a cradle. Oh, but they are not for children, Mrs. Pepper explained. Phineas sighed. I will mark but one, he said. One free white female, thus counted. As Phineas marched outside and approached the door of the next house, Mrs. Pepper scurried close behind. That house is empty, Mr. Bump, she called out. Phineas knocked on door after door, but every house was empty. Not a single person in the town of Tunbridge could be found. Widow Pepper, are you telling me that in all of Tunbridge there is not but one free white female, he asked. Twould appear so, said Miss Pepper with a twinkle in her eye. Then I shall post the results so that anyone who disputes the facts may come forth, and if none disputes them by tomorrow, they shall be declared fair and true, and so shall they stand. Phineas nailed the results of his tally to the chestnut tree that stood in the town square. Blue, he said, today I have been played for a fool, but tomorrow we shall see who has the last laugh. At that very moment, Boston Pepper came running in. Ma, ma, he shouted. I've been to the next town over, and it's not for taxes or soldiers. He's counting the people. It's to figure out how many men we sent to the new government. What do you mean, said Mrs. Pepper. The more people he counts, the more men we'll send to the new government in Philadelphia. The more men we send, the more votes we get. And that's how we'll get the things we need, like good roads and regular mail delivery. Carp and cod, exclaimed Mrs. Pepper. We must trick the tally man into counting us again. But how? Don't worry, Ma, said Boston. I've got a plan. That night, Phineas again lay down to sleep among the tall white pines, still thinking of his Jenny and missing her more than ever. The next morning he rose. Citizen of Tunbridge, he called out, are the results as posted fair and true? Not entirely, said Mrs. Pepper. I think, sir, that you must count again. Phineas shook his head. Madam, he said, that I cannot do. I am entirely out of paper. Mrs. Pepper frowned. Paper was rare indeed. The tallyman turned to leave. Wait, I will gather your paper, Mrs. Pepper declared. By tomorrow, you will have a ledger full. Then she added in a whisper, a thin ledger full. Phineas shook his head again. But, madam, he said, I have neither quills nor ink. Mrs. Pepper pursed her lips. We will boil you six pots of ink and gather a dozen quills. But, madam, said Phineas, I could not possibly sleep another night at the White Pine Inn. He turned again to leave. Mrs. Pepper squinted. Constance devotion runs in ordinary. You must stay there free of charge. Oh, but madame, said Phineas, with a twinkle in his eye, I am afraid I'm not fit to be seen in such a fine place. My cloak, you see. Mrs. Pepper held out her hand. Give it to me, tally man. I will mend it myself. Phineas breakfasted that day on frumetry and mutton chops, dined on beefsteaks and baked beans, and supped on bread and butter and beer. He slept in a feather bed, and in the morning his cloak was better than new. On the steps of the ordinary, Phineas found a wood-backed leather-bound ledger with twenty sheets of paper sewn into it, six pots of the blackest ink, and a dozen turkey quills. Well rested, well fed, and well supplied, Phineas knocked on Mrs. Pepper's door. Madame, he said, I have come to count your family. Of course, of course, Mr. Bump, do come in. Please meet my er, recently returned husband, Mr. Samuel Pepper. And with him, said Mrs. Pepper with a wave of her arm, my 15 children. 
Seventeen souls under one roof, said Phineas. At the Swindle House, Phineas counted a husband, a wife, a brother, his wife, a father, and twenty-two children. At the Grape House, he counted a husband, a wife, two cousins, and thirteen children. And at the Thick Penny House, he counted a husband, a wife, two sisters, their husbands, four sets of grandparents, and thirty-seven children. By sunset, Phineas had counted 1,726 people. He nailed the results to the chestnut tree. Citizens and animals of Tunbridge, he announced, I have posted the results of my tally. If none disputes them by tomorrow, they shall be declared fair and true, and so shall they stand. Then he walked through the evening gloom to his room at the ordinary grumbling. Tis a tally, not worth the paper it is written on. Just then, Boston came bursting through the door of the Pepper House. Ma, he called, I've been talking to a stranger who's passing through, and he says the counting is for taxes and soldiers, heaven help us, and for sending men to represent us in the new government. Both, asked Mrs. Pepper. Both, answered Boston. Cheese and chowder, said Mrs. Pepper. She pressed her hands to her temples. If the tally man's count is high, we will owe too much in taxes and soldiers. If the tally man's count is low, we will have a weak voice in the new government. Who thought of this method? The men who wrote the Constitution, said Boston. Clever devils they be, shouted Mrs. Pepper. Oh, Boston, what is your plan now? Boston paced the floor and tapped his forehead. He pulled his hair. He rubbed his nose. He picked up the fire poker and waved it about. Mother, he finally said, I'm working on it. The next morning, Phineas slept late. The cows were milked and grazing on the common by the time he had packed up and saddled Old Blue. As Phineas and Blue approached the chestnut tree, he called out, Citizens of Tunbridge, are the results as posted fair and true? Not entirely, said Mrs. Pepper. I think, sir, that you must count again. Madame Pepper, shouted Phineas, I have been away from my dearest wife for three months. I will not stay in Tunbridge even one more day. Boston pushed his way through the crowd. Sir, if you will, but count us one more time, I shall deliver to you a letter from your wife. Impossible, declared Phineas. I promise it, declared Boston. Phineas stared at Boston. Then I will count, he said, one more time. And so Phineas walked from house to house. By evening, he had counted 487 people. He nailed the results to the old chestnut tree and called out, Citizens of Tunbridge, I ask you now, are the results as posted fair and true? Boston Pepper stepped forward. Fair and true they are, good sir. Then he pulled a letter from behind his back and handed it to Phineas. The poster writer came through early this morning. He's been asking for a Mr. Phineas bump through half the towns in Vermont. Phineas broke the seal on the letter and read Jenny's words. Only Boston was near enough to see the tears of joy that sparkled in the tally man's eyes. Phineas folded the letter and coughed once. My dear Jenny is well, he said stiffly, and she sends news. We are to have a child in the spring. Boston turned to the shuttered houses and yelled, His dear Jenny is well, and they will have a child come spring. A loud huzzah rose up from the town, and the people spilled out into the square. You know, Mr. Bump, said Boston, I would have given you the letter even if you'd refused to count. And I, young man, would have counted you even without this letter. Then he raised his hand solemnly and said, For count you I must, and count you I did. And now my job is well, and verily done entirely. And so Phineas Bump rode out of the town of Tunbridge, no longer heartsick, saddle sore, or down on his luck. Many more weeks of counting lay ahead of him, but now he traveled with a far lighter heart. Mrs. Pepper and Boston watched as Phineas rode into the Vermont woods. Ah, Boston, said Mrs. Pepper, I guess we are not the town that tricked the tally man after all. Sure we are, Ma, said Boston. We're the town that tricked the tally man twice, but then... He winked at his mother. We decided twas better to be fair and true, and so we were entirely. Well, there you have it. That's how Phineas counted the town of Tunbridge. For yourself, just remember, go to my2020census.gov. It provides us with a voice in Washington, D.C., and any extra funding for your state. So please, please sign that. Have a great day, you guys.